But light in the darkness, oh my God, that is who you are. Well, this morning, I want to continue in our series. I hope you've been enjoying, uh, enjoying the uh, Joshua series. But I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Joshua. And we're moving to chapter 22. From memory, I think I was on Joshua 20 in our last uh, visit when we shared. And now Joshua 22 as the journey continues. And while you're turning there, a bit of context for you. So uh, I mentioned the fact that Joshua was getting old and that he had divided the land appropriately according to the size of the people. According to their size, he allotted more land for a bigger tribe of Israel and less land for a smaller. And so everything was done, and not every battle had been fought and won yet. And the command from Joshua was, go and fight. And now that he had done that, and he is now towards the end of his life, Joshua is now releasing those who had uh, claimed the territory on the west side of the Jordan River. He's saying, you can go home now. And so we're going to take, uh, we're going to carry on that story now. Joshua chapter 22, and we're reading from verse 19. So follow with me in your Bibles. I'm reading from the NIV version. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh in Canaan to return to Gilead, their own land, which they had acquired in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. When they came to Geliloth, Near the Jordan, in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, listen to this, built an imposing altar. I mean, how big was this altar to be imposing? I mean, everyone had seen altars before, but there was something peculiar about this one. It was imposing there by the Jordan. Verse 11, And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan at Galiloth near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. So the Israelites sent Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, to the land of Gilead to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. With him they sent ten of the chief men, one for each of the tribes of Israel, each the head of a family division among the Israelite clans. When they went to Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they said to them, the whole assembly of the Lord says, how could you break faith with a God of Israel like this? How could you turn away from the Lord and build yourselves an altar in rebellion against him now? And there's some verses I continue on that explain why. They said, when we rebelled against God, our nation, a whole nation was wiped out. And we are the descendants. Our parents could not enter the land because of their disobedience, because of their rebellion. And now you do this thing? Follow with me now to verse 24. Just skip down. Verse 24. And this is a reply of the three tribes. They said, no, we did it for fear that someday your descendants might say to ours, what do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, Reubenites and Gadites, you have no share in the Lord. So your descendants might cause ours to stop fearing the Lord. That is why he said, let us, that is why we said, let us get ready and build an altar, but not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us and you and the generations that follow that we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. Now this passage has a lot contained in there to unpack. In fact, you might say that the stronger message in this particular passage is this, the danger of assuming. You know what happens when you assume? 
I'm so glad you said that because I wasn't actually going to say it from the microphone, but you make that out of you and me. Take the first three letters. Okay, there you go. You're welcome. Take that one away. We don't assume. So there's a danger in assuming. Perhaps maybe it is about the skill of being able to uh, resolve conflict. Maybe that's another lesson. But what I really felt the Holy Spirit wanted me to focus on is a message on the altar. I don't speak much about these things. What is the altar? What is the relevance of the altar today? Is it relevant for you? Is it relevant for me? Or is it simply an Old Testament concept? Why did something so small, even though the passage clearly says it was an imposing altar? So it wasn't small. I'm just using this as words. It was just an altar, okay? Just an altar. But it was enough to be a spark for a war, a civil war to happen in the land of Israel. So to understand the message today, I need to unpack a couple things. Firstly, what is an altar? What's the significance to us? And secondly, is it important to us as Christians in New Testament times? So let me tell you first what an altar is. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it tells us that it is an elevated platform where this platform was used to offer sacrifices to God. It talks about a killing. The word altar actually means to kill. So something must die at the altar. Now let me put a few things together for you. We worship in what we call the house of God. You might hear us sometimes say, come on, come to the house of God. Let's worship in the house of God. Jesus declared about the temple, my house, he didn't call it my temple, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. Why is he using these words? But I want to attach that word, the house of God, to where we are meeting today. This is an expression. It's not the expression of the house of God. It is a house of God in this nation of Australia. So what constitutes what we consider a house of God? There are three things that you need. Number one, as you probably guessed it, it's an altar. Everyone say altar. Thank you. An altar. Number two, you needed a priest. And number three, you needed a sacrificial offering. Okay, three ingredients to make a church a house of God. Number one, you need an altar. Number two, you need a priest. Number three, you need a sacrificial offering. So let me go again. Mary Webster says, an altar is a raised structure or a place on which sacrifices are offered or incense is burned. But in modern times, I don't know if you grew up with this one, but when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, we used to call the stage the altar. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. If you'd like to give your life to Jesus, come to the altar. And in today's vernacular, we're thinking, what the heck is an altar? (laughs) Right? What is an altar? And in fact, if they knew what an altar is, would that not sort of cause some alarm bells to you? But you kill things at the altar. (laughs) What? Why are you saying to come to the altar? Are you going to kill us? Is this your rod of passage? I know Christianity is a religion, you know, that was, it has a history of blood. Are you going to kill us at the altar? No, I'm not going to do that. It's a metaphor. It's simply a metaphor, but it is very, very true and very, very powerful when you understand this. So number one, you need an altar, right? A raised platform. Well, we've got that. We, we call it a stage. The second thing that you need is a priest. And you may ask, where is the priest? Turn to the person next to you and tell them, I'm a priest. Go to the other person and turn around the other side and say, neighbor, I have a priest sitting next to me. You see, what happens is invariably in church, because we're so used to facing forward, you you have your back to the person behind you, don't even look at them. In fact, you probably, unless I tell you to turn to the person next to you, you stare straight forward at me. And we create this culture where we forget who we are. You are a priest serving in the house of God. And if you don't get this, you're not going to the house of God. You're just attending, you're going to a building to go to a service. And that's the depth of the character of a church. That's about it. But that is not the plan that God has for you. This is the house of God. And we must understand the principles of the house of God. So number one, we have an altar. That's the stage. 
We have priests, not just one. Jesus said, when you make a decision to follow after him, I'm not saying just, Jesus, come into my life. I'm sorry for my sins. I mean, follow after God. It's easy to be a Christian because you can point to the day I surrendered my life to Jesus. When I was growing up, I remembered they used to say this, the pastors from the platform, if you don't know the day when you were born again, when you gave your life to Jesus, then you were never really born again. How many people heard that preach before? Okay, I'm not the only one. A lot of old hands raised there. Some of them are like, <laughs> it's okay, you're good company. But I, I can't tell the day when I was first saved. I was, I was four years old. I don't know the actual day. I was a kid. How could I possibly remember that? But here's the thing. I could say I'm a Christian, gave my life to Jesus at the age of four, and lived like the devil the rest of my life. Lived like the rest of the world. But that's not what I was called to. I was called to follow Jesus. That's what you are. You're a disciple. So the moment you, you declared, I will follow Jesus... I will follow after him. You became a kingdom of priests. That's how the Bible describes it. So we have an altar, the stage. We have the priests. I'm one of them. But there's one more thing missing. You need a sacrifice. Can I ask you a question? What sacrifice did you offer God today when you came here? You see, you can't go into the house of God empty-handed. See, in the temple worship, they knew that. Everyone came with something into the house of God. And I'm not just talking about finances, if your mind is going there. I'm talking about this worship that you bring in the house of God. If you were to ask me what is one thing that you absolutely desire for this church, Pastor, I'll tell you this, that the people would understand the heart of God and worship Him. Give him the worship that he's due to not come to church and just go through a service. What's the joy in that? What, I mean, what do you really get out of it? What happens is, what we've done is, we have taken something very precious to God and we have watered it down. But to understand the altars, you have to go back to the Bible and go back to the very beginning to when the first altar was built. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 4 where a man called Cain had this idea in his heart where he created this raised platform. I don't know where he got the idea from, but he felt, I need to build this raised platform. And he took stuff that he grew. He had vegetable gardens. He was a green thumb. And he took that. He put it on the altar as a thanksgiving offering to God. His younger brother sees what he did. And he decides to build the second altar ever recorded in history. He builds this altar, but he does something different. Instead of taking vegetables and plants, his job was that he raised livestock. And so he went to his sheep, and he went to the firstborn of his flock, and he picked the very best of the firstborn. Remember the first, well, we don't know this. Among the firstborn, they're the strongest. They have the best genes. That's how they saw it. And so that was very precious, that animal, because they would use that for breeding in the future. So by offering the firstborn, he was cutting off his potential for earnings in the future. And so he gave something very, very precious. We call it a sacrifice because it cost him something. And I have wrestled over this over the years, and I have my own take on it, and I have listened to what other commentators would say. Why did God accept Abel's sacrifice, and yet he rejected Cain's? Why? I would argue that the difference was Cain gave a thanksgiving offering. He gave out of his abundance, which is nothing wrong. And I wonder if Cain was the only one who gave an offering, would God have accepted his sacrifice? But because his brother showed him up and gave something sacrificial, that drew the heart of God. Somebody needs to write this down. Sacrifice draws the heart of God. Across the week, there are individuals in this church who sacrifice much to the Lord. Yes, they do sacrifice finances, but more than often than not, they sacrifice their time in the house of God. Just hours upon hours serving God as an act of worship before God, as a priest in the house of God. But other commentators would declare this. They would say, no, no. The reason why God rejected the, the vegetables 
was that he was making a statement that, uh, that it's more than the sacrifice. It's that you are giving something that is a living, a living animal. That's what you sacrifice. Why? Because there will be a shedding of blood. And the Bible says that there's life in the blood. And so it was important to sacrifice something that was living. So as a priest in the house of God, let me give this question to you again. When you came to the altar today, what did you offer God? Did you offer Him an offering? Or did you offer Him a sacrifice? You see the difference? Some of you, you I know your hearts. You are absolutely lost in the worship. You don't even know what's going on around you. Whereas others, and I've been in both camps, uh, sitting there observing what's going on, you know, just sort of deciding if you'll sing the song. I don't know the song, so I'm just going to stand and just watch it. Okay, I'll just watch. I remember uh, Rick Warren talks about this, how he would have people come up and visit him, visit his church. He, he, he's now resigned from that church, Saddleback Church. They had about 40,000 people in his time worshiping. And people who are visiting would come to him and say, Pastor Rick, I really enjoy the worship today. You will find this in his book, Purpose Driven Life. And he says, well, that's really good, but it wasn't for you. See, we've, we've got this mentality that we, we become people where we expect to be served. We, we feel entitled. In fact, if the song isn't good enough, I refuse to sing. But it isn't for you. The team here do their very best to help you to be able to offer an offering to God. Is everyone okay? So we talked about a few things that you can offer, right? It's a sacrifice or it's a thanksgiving offering. Here's another one we don't often talk about. What else is offered? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 8 that there is an altar in heaven. If you want to write this down, Revelation 8 verse 3 to 4 says this, a picture of what is being offered. Another angel who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. So right before the throne of God, there's an altar. So the altars we have on earth is a reflection of one that is in heaven. Obviously, altars are important if there's one in heaven. Verse 4 says, The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hands. So we're saying that there are different kinds of altars and different kinds of offerings that we bring to the Lord, but one of them is prayer. And at Life City Church, we have an altar of prayer. We have it on Tuesday. We have it on Thursday. We have it on Friday. And we have it on Sunday. We pray for 30 minutes here before the service ever starts. From 8.45 to 9.15, calling on the name of the Lord. Why? Because if you cannot trust God and begin calling out to Him, how can you expect miracles? We need God to come and turn lives around. We can't just stay in church and listen to a clever word. It must be the power of God. So collectively, what do we have to offer God at the altar? We worship through giving finances. We worship through giving songs to the Lord, songs of love and affection, declaring the goodness of God, the deeds that he's done, and we offer up prayers to the Lord. You cannot come to the altar empty-handed. So at this boundary to the land, in the, uh, at the Jordan River, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the tribe of Manasseh, they built an altar that looks strangely familiar to the altar that God commanded Israel to build while in the tabernacle. And they knew, all Israel knew, what that altar was for. It's for sacrifice. It's for sacrifice. So immediately thinking, they're going to lead that whole uh, one-third of our nation, oh, sorry, one-quarter of our nation astray because they're going to be sacrificing at a false altar. This is a replica altar. And in much the same way we do that in church, if we're not careful, we too might create replicas, exchanging the house of God for a house of man. Instead of an altar, we have a stage. Instead of a sacrifice, we have a show. And instead of priests, we have performers. Do you know what performers do? A performer's job is to entertain the crowd. 
A performer's job is to keep them pleased. A performer's job is to tell people what they want to hear. But that is not a priest's job. And so we've turned the house of God into a replica. It's a house of man. If we do this, we cheapen the house of God. And this was the reason that the northern tribes of Israel were ready to make war. Notice that the western tribes built the altar at a place called Geliloth. I had to look this one up. It comes from the, the Hebrew root word gelia, meaning border, boundary, or the edge of the property. So here's a question I want to ask you. What are you building at the edges of your life? Maybe I could rephrase it another way. If you are living on the edge day after day, it's a battle after battle after battle. Perhaps you have not built an altar to God. You're very quiet today. Let's continue on. When Abel gave the sacrifice, so we know what he gave and what God approved, the Bible says that he gave an animal's life. And he put this on this altar. That word altar, again, I'll give you some, some understanding here, comes from a, Greek, uh, from a Hebrew word, mitzbeah. It comes from a root word meaning to kill. So what you offer at the altar has to be something that you kill. What are you killing in your life? You know the Bible says that we pay our tithes and offerings for a reason. Why? Because it teaches men to fear God. That's one reason. But the second one is so that envy and desire and lust will not overtake your heart. So you kill something about your heart. Because the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So you're killing something at the altar, part of your heart, so that it will not trap you. And so something has to be brought to the Lord that costs you. You can't just give out of the overflow. Well, if I feel like worshiping, I might sing the song. No, no, that's an offering. You need to give God a sacrifice. The Bible tells us a story of a woman of ill repute. That meant that she was sleeping around, probably a prostitute. She found out where God, or Jesus, was meeting with his disciples and some honored guests in the home of a Pharisee, a priest. And so she brought along with her an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. You need to understand the jar didn't have a lid that you can just take off and put back on. Once the value was, while well, it was contained in the box. But the moment, it's more a jar not, uh, rather than a box. And when you broke open the jar, you can't put the perfume back in or keep it. It was gone. The Bible tells us and records that the worth of that alabaster jar of perfume was equivalent to approximately a year's wages. A year's wages in Australia is $70,000. Would you be willing to give $70,000 to the Lord? That's what she did. That's what we call a sacrifice. And we see the expression of Jesus and the reaction of this sacrifice. It was so powerful. It was a sacrifice, and it drew the heart of God. The Bible says, let me continue on. When an angel of death came to Israel, David made a mistake. He was a king. And God never told him to take a census of the armies of Israel, but he did. Against the advice of his men, he decided, no, no, I want a census. I want to know how much of an army we have. And so because of that, a curse came upon the land, a plague that killed tens of thousands of people in the land. I think it was hundred and something thousand. Many, many people died. And so David knew that at the end of three days, that it, this will go on, he needed to make a sacrifice to stop the plague. And the Bible says he went to the place, he saw an angel standing in the place. He was the angel that brought the plague, killing people, swinging a sword around, and people were dying wherever he swung his sword. And so David goes to that place. It belonged to a man called Arauna, the Hittite. And at that place, he says to Arauna, I need to buy your land, and I, I need to make an altar here. I need to make a sacrifice. Can I also buy your oxen? And listen to the expression, what happens next. Arana says to the king, oh, no, king, people are dying. Take the land. Take the oxen. But look at David's expression in 2 Samuel 24, 24. He says, no, I insist on paying you for it. 
I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Do you get the expression? There's something going on, this repetitive thing that's happening saying you cannot give God out of your abundance and overflow. You have to give out of who you are. Your very being. In fact, Paul challenges the church in Romans 12 when he says, offer your bodies. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy, pleasing to God. Notice he doesn't say as living offerings. He uses the word living sacrifices. In fact, something must die. And he goes on, he says, that is your spiritual act of worship. Yet we come to church We can't even raise our hands. We can't even sing the songs because it isn't good enough. I don't know the song. The band isn't good enough. I'm not. I'm not judging you, by the way. Okay, I'm just speaking right now. I'm just preaching. Everyone's like, (laughs) I've done that. I've been there. Thanks, sis. I've been there before. I've done that. You know what? Can I tell you? Wickedness of my heart. I grew up in a Pentecostal movement. My parents in their ministry saw every kind of miracle, healing, signs, and wonders. And the people that worshipped in our church in Indonesia back then were exuberant in their worship. When they prayed, it was like thunder. These are people training for ministry and in church. They would kneel down on their chairs with had wooden slats, and they would take their hands, they were folded, and they were rapping like this. Imagine we're talking hundreds of people rapping on these chairs. It was like thunder. It was loud as people are wailing and crying out to God. This was an altar of prayer. It was an altar of sacrifice. It was precious to the Lord. Let me tell you, it draws the heart of God to a place. But why? Why is it so difficult to get the Western church to worship God? We want a show. We want to, we're asking for it. We're begging for it. Listen to the words you say, I didn't know the song. So you perform the song, I know. Or we're saying, that wasn't good enough singing. I, I got lost. Ah, I can't sing it. You're wanting a performance. The band didn't sound right. The levels weren't right. I can't hear it properly. It's not that nice, so I'm not going to worship in this one. You are begging for a performance. Yet this is the house of God, a house of prayer for nations. Let me tell you this. When Cain gave his offering, the Bible says that God accept. sorry, Abel. Abel gave his offering. God accepted the sacrifice. The commentators tell us that everyone saw in that time a visual understanding that God accepted it because fire came from heaven and exhumed the sacrifice. It burnt the whole thing. And from that moment on, every living person understood that to give a sacrifice required that an animal, unfortunately pagans were killing babies and offering them at the altar. In fact, the worship of Baal was a statue to Baal. He had hands, and there was an opening here, and he was lit on fire, burning hot metal, and people would take their babies and put it in the hands of Baal, and they would roll into the fire and die. Horrible, horrible thing. It was demonized. That's not what God intended. But the sacrifice was something God intended. It's very, very important to us. So fire came down and people understood the tangible sign of the approval of God is fire. Is it any wonder that the sign that the Holy Spirit came and approved the people in the upper room praying? Jesus said, wait, wait, wait. They didn't know what to do. Jesus, you left us. You left us. What, who are we going to follow now? He said, wait. Wait, wait. And for 50 days from Passover until Pentecost, they prayed every single day. 120 people every day. Nothing happened day one. They kept praying. Nothing happened day two. They kept praying. Nothing happened day 21. They kept praying. It was for 50 days that they prayed. And then, and only then, something changed and happened. They heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And the next thing they saw, what looked like tongues of fire setting a light on the people, and they began to pray in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. The fire is a sign that God accepts you. And sacrifices attract the fire of God because it pleases Him. Here's the thing I want you to grab hold of. We are living on the edge of a last and great final revival of God. 
It's been prophesied by many people over the years that there will be revival across this nation of Australia that will hit the rest of the world. But at the moment, people are thinking, oh, but have you seen the census report, Pastor? Have you seen these things? You know, we are less of a godly nation. Half the, half the nation now are, are claimed to be Christians. We are declining. Well, let me tell you, if you understood what was happening in the time of Wales before the Welsh revival, according to history, the, the historians tell us that at that time, the churches were closing down. Christianity was almost extinct. In fact, the pubs and the brothels were opening up everywhere across Wales, and they thought God is dead in Wales. But here's the thing. Many prayed. Many prayed for revival, and I used to quote this, that, you know, before every major great revival, it was preceded by two years of prayer. I was wrong. I did more research, and I found out probably the people that prayed with him prayed for two years. But Evan Roberts prayed for 13 years for revival. I'm looking at my age, 54 years old. You add 13 to that, I'm going to be 67 years old before revival comes to this nation. But we didn't start today. There have been people praying and digging wells of revival. They paid the price. They sacrificed their time. They sacrificed finances to pray. We recently came from a prayer rally, and we met in Suncorp Stadium. There was a man from the islands. I forget which island. It's not the major ones. But he had a vision from the Lord. And he saw that, pe- that, that Suncorp Stadium was filled with Christians, tens of thousands of Christians, praying for revival for the nation, and revival came. And up to now, this is apparently the fourth year they've done this, and I've been part of it, that they were meeting on the outside of Suncorp Stadium. This year, we met inside the stadium. It's begun. God is doing something. There's a prayer movement being birthed. But what did this revival look like? Let me tell you. Some suggest that revival is simply multiples of people coming into a saving knowledge of Jesus, making a decision for Christ. And in fact, that was the case in the Welsh revival. In, with no advertising at all, during the two years of, of revival, approximately 70,000 people came to Christ in the first two months And over the course of the rest of the two years, 100,000 people came to know Christ and followed Christ at that time. But there's more to salvation than just souls, than just the decision to follow Jesus. A well-known skeptic in that town, this is one of many stories, interrupted Evan Roberts, a man who prayed for revival, as he preached. He said this, I want to ask a question. Imagine this, I'm preaching and this heckler comes up. I want to ask a question. Totally disrespectful. But Evan Roberts kept right on preaching, ignoring him. And he kept going louder. I want to ask a question. Evan Roberts kept preaching. And this guy eventually pushes his way to come. And before he hits the front of the altar, history records this man fell down so powerfully under the power of God that if it wasn't for the the fact that people caught him, he would have split his head open. He was thrown back by the power of God. In fact, people were experiencing such moves of God in this revival. They were literally crying out at different times throughout the service, no more, Lord Jesus, or I die. That was the actual language, quote, unquote. No more, Lord Jesus, or I die. Such was the power of the presence of God upon the people who were listening. They're thinking, my body can't take this anymore. It wasn't just a mental ascent. Their whole body was feeling crushed, was feeling on fire, and they couldn't take it anymore. They're saying, God, I can't take anymore. I can't take anymore. If you give me any more fire, I will die. Where is that power of the Lord today? There was widespread singing. There wasn't instruments. They just started singing, and everyone began to sing to the Lord. They had prolonged meetings. They weren't checking their time. Such was the move of God. They didn't want to miss out. And people lined up across the streets, across whole blocks, trying to get into this place to worship God. Can I finish with a few quick things? The thing is, when you build an altar... It will arouse warfare. We're building an altar of prayer in this church, an altar of worship. But it will arouse warfare, and you have to get ready for it. You know, we, we've never thought that Roe v. Wade would be overturned. Everyone familiar with that? Roe v. Wade. Almost 50 years ago, 
the law uh, was enacted uh, federally. That meant that every every state in the United States had to uh, had to allow abortions, whether they agreed with it or not. Thirteen states had actually enacted. Uh, bylaws in, in their laws in that state saying if Roe v. Wade was, is overturned we can immediately ban abortions. Now every state, you just get this right though, they're painting a different picture on the news. Every state has the right to vote for it if they want the abortions or not. 13 states in the United States, they estimate around half the states of the United States do they want abortion abolished. Half. And so the others are working towards that. Now they have the freedom. But it was impossible. How can you overturn Roe v. Wade? It's almost 50 years. I gave this figure recently. Do you know how many babies have died in that time? Over 60 million. In fact, the figure is about 64 and a half million babies have died since Roe v. Wade just in the United States. For a bit of perspective, do you know the population of Australia today? 26 close. It just, it just popped up last year, 26. So more than twice the population of our nation have been killed in 49 years. Babies offered in the, as a sacrifice to a pagan God and people not, not even aware of it. You know, when we first planted Live City Church six years ago, uh, the principal wanted to come see me, so we met together and Norton Sands at that time, he shared with me, he says, you know, Pastor Paul, before we built the school, the police came to see me. And they said, look, I, we know you're building the school, but we just need to tell you that there's uh, an incredible amount of witchcraft in this area. There's bodies of animals that have been sacrificed in this area and many more on the top of White Rock. And I knew that when we planted this church, if we did not have a house of prayer, we would be destroyed. I'm looking around the audience and I see some people that were with me. Ben was there and, and Marty and others, Bruce. We prayed every Sunday afternoon. Remember that? If we didn't pray, I feel we were lost. Do you know when we planted our church, there were four other churches at Staines. Were you aware of that? Four of the, three met in the morning with us and one met in the afternoon. None of them lasted. I'm not saying they didn't pray, but I, I don't know what happened. All I know is we prayed. Not only have we survived, we are thriving in Jesus' name. You've got to give a hand to the Lord for that. Because we pray. We are a church that prays.